It's just my great pleasure to introduce our next uh, speaker. Uh, so uh, Julian Conadat is Associate Professor of Biomedical Engineering at, at École Polytechnique uh, de Montreal and Canada Research Chair in Quantitative uh, Magnetic Resonance Imaging. Uh, so Julian is an expert in many forms of high field imaging, including uh, spinal cord imaging, although today he's going to be telling us about in vivo histology with ultra-field MRI. Julian, thanks for coming. Thanks a lot for the invitation. Um, it's, it's, it's a great honor to be here, as well as a um, um, great pleasure to, to see old friends, uh, familiar faces. So yeah, really glad to be here. And um, I wanted to keep the title short, but I will talk about spinal cord. Uh, so just the little stories that, um, so I, I did my PhD in Montreal. I'm originally from France. Uh, so my PhD was between 2005 and 2008, and uh, towards the end, I, uh, Rick, who was actually uh, on my on my committee in Montreal, um, um, put me in touch with uh, with Larry Wald. So it's uh, re through Rick that uh, I ended up at MGH. Um, sorry about that. Maybe I can just try to put it close by. So yeah, it's um, through Rick that uh, I got in touch with Larry, and then. Um, started my postdoc uh, between 2009 and finished in 2012. And uh, since then I came back to Montreal. So I'm part of this uh, massive French invasion uh, that is happening in Quebec. Um, and uh, so the, the little story that um, on my very first day at, uh, at the Martinos, Larry brought me to this uh, place, Tavern on the Water, uh, which is now known as the Pier 6, I believe, if it has not changed its name again. Um, so we, we sat down and then Laurie told me, well, you should really try this uh, local specialty called uh, clam chowder. And at that time, I, my understanding of English pronunciation was not very accurate. So I understood clam ch cheddar instead of clam chowder. Uh, and um, then when the, when the waitress came with a gigantic mug of melted cheddar, I was quite horrified. <laughs> uh, so I, I ate everything. And it took me quite, like it took me several weeks to, uh, to find out that cheddar and chowder are actually two different words. Um, and I, I never told uh, that story to Larry. So <laughs> it's, a, it's a true story. Uh, anyway, apart from the local uh, delicacy, we also talked about um, uh, projects that I would be working on. Uh, one of the projects was to try to, to bring um, spinal cord uh, on, the, on the 70 to uh, push that field as well as uh, working on uh, mapping MS lesions. And I was with my uh, other uh, advisor, Dr. Katerina Mainero. So um, at that time, um, people were interested and that's, that's really uh, what uh, Jeff Dunn was uh, talking about and also Bob Turner, that uh, the, there was this um, uh, wave of researchers looking into mapping uh, Cyto as well as Milo architecture. And 70 was a nice place to to, to be because of the higher uh, sensitivity in a tabli, uh, some, something shown by uh, Nicholas Bach, um, highly uh, correlated uh, mining content with, uh, with T1, uh, T1 contrasts. Uh, going to in vivo, um, Marcel Weiss from uh, Bob Turner's group uh, showed some nice uh, in vivo mapping in the, in the human cortex using T1. Um, at Glasser, I also showed some T1 over T2 contrast. And um, that's a, a, like a result uh, showed by Jeff Dunn um, that using T2 star, uh, which, and, which is even more interesting at 70, at higher field, uh, we get uh, quite remarkable correlations with myelin, but also with, uh, with iron content. So we moved to the in vivo, and that's our work, um, like an average mapping of uh, several healthy uh, controls, uh, looking at... Um, at the different um, mild architecture across the uh, cortical ribbon. We also looked at different um, uh, depth um, in the cortex as well as the orientation uh, dependency. So this, this was quite interesting. And later on, my, my student, um, Gabriel Manja, uh, spent some time at MGH uh, with, uh, with Katerina. And he, he basically combined uh, T2 star with MTR to gain further specificity to, uh, to, to mining content. Um, so uh, keeping in mind the clinical application, uh, Katrina Mainero started uh, showing some remarkable results of uh, 
like a killer application of, of 70 is really to, to see better um, the cortical pathology in, uh, in multiple sclerosis. So that was an article published in 2009. And since then, she, she continued uh, pushing the field um, by showing further correlation with not only focal lesion, but also diffuse demyelination in the cortex, which are very difficult to, almost impossible to see at uh, a clower field. Since then, we, we've had a couple of publications. It's been very prolific uh, work. Uh, I, I was not able to, to, to basically put all the uh, papers because I didn't have enough uh, space on my slide. Uh, but um, I wanted to keep a little bit of space here to really emphasize that uh, there is one missing uh, piece of the puzzle, which is that MS does not only affect the brain, but also the spinal cord. So this is really where things get combined and where th that gave us a further motivation to really push the, the field of uh, spinal cord MRI at 70. So I, I built um, a single loop, a uh, transmit receive loop, uh, and we tried it out on the, on the subjects. So that was one of the first uh, spinal cord data we acquired in a subject in the thoracic spinal cord. That was a multi-echo GRE sequence. You can see a lot of ugly ghosting and poor fat saturation and like anyway. So we also tried EPI and uh, there was obviously no optimization at all. We just tried uh, out of the box without any reduced field of view, um, acceleration, um, and so on. So the next step really was to try to get a better coil, a better receive coil as well as transmit coil. So um, we thought that we would uh, refactor um, a 3T uh, C-spine coil that um, I built. Um, it was actually Asma Marayam uh, who um, built uh, most of the coil. Um, and that was a remarkable coil because it has very um, tight fitting. There's a lot of loops around the neck and uh, it provides an extremely high SNR. So the, this color has been used for many, many years uh, with a lot of applications. Uh, and uh, for the little story that the photo shoot in our sexy uh, uh, photo shoot studio, uh, I think it was uh, John and Thomas's office. Um, but anyway, so using that coil former in geometry, uh, Wei Zhao was postdoc at the time. Um, took on the work of uh, building a, a four-channel transmit array with in mind uh, doing parallel transmits as well as a 19-channel receive coin. Um, and that really um, helped tremendously. So after a couple of optimization um, uh, on, on, the, on the sequence aspect, on the adjusting also the, uh, the phase between the transmit arrays, uh, we were able to get uh, remarkable images uh, that made also the cover of MRM. And um, so that's an image that is often uh, shown um, comparing the, like the product 3T, the 3T with, uh, with uh, our optimized 32-channel um, uh, head-neck coil and uh, the 7T, um, like trying to match um, acquisition time and uh, parameters, we really get like a huge improvement in terms of SNR. And then uh, we did a couple of uh, clinical applications. Uh, so that was uh, in collaboration with Nazem Atasi uh, at MGH. Uh, we imaged a couple of patients with uh, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. And uh, we show a really remarkable um, signal, um, like higher signal intensity in the lateral corticospinal tract, uh, which um, what was remarkable is that those were early uh, patients. And so at 3T, we would not be able to see as well this uh, higher signal intensity. Another clinical application, a uh, patient which uh, was referred to by Anne-Louisa Klander at MGH, uh, who had a very focal lesion uh, due to ischemia. And we see this, um, this signal drop out. But what's also remarkable is that if we go rostral to the lesion, we see a very like small hyperintense signal due to valerian degener degeneration. That's something that is extremely difficult to see at 3T. Um, and should also mention other groups, a uh, group in Marseille, uh, Virginie Calo uh, and um, Manuel Tazo, they acquired multi-parametric MRI of the spinal cord and showed remarkable uh, mapping of the myelo and cytoarchitecture in, uh, in vivo in, in humans. 
There's also the work of uh, Rob Barry, who at the time was at uh, Van der Bilt, and uh, he did some uh, remarkable studies on resting state of MRI, uh, showing that so there, is, there are actually neurons in the spinal cord, uh, and, and we can do fMRI and resting state uh, fMRI with it. So Rob is now a faculty at um, MGH. He's a remarkable researcher, and uh, it's, I'm glad to collaborate with him, and I'm sure he will push the, uh, the field of uh, spinal cord 70 uh, even further at MGH. Um, so all the results I presented to you were, you know, seems that it's fairly easy to get nice um, images of the spinal cord. Um, in fact, uh, when we get, when we sit at the console and we push the, the button to get EPIs or whatever, it, uh, we find out that the path is long and uh, filled with uh, obstacles. And that's for 3T. When we go to 7T and we try, uh, it, it gets even uh, more difficult. So why is that? Um, I would say that one, one of the main culprits um, are um, the, the inhomogeneities. And so we can start talking about static B0 inhomogeneities, which uh, de facto increase at uh, higher field strength. So when we try to get a uh, sagittal image with EPI, we see that there are not only those ugly di distortions, um, which are related to the fact that there is a lot of um, structure with different susceptibility profile. But that creates all sorts of problems. The, the, the fat saturation does not work. Uh, the, the, Water might might be the water signal might be suppressed, so we might end up with a with a beer, big dark hole and only seeing the fat, for example. So it, it makes things extremely unreliable and obviously difficult to apply um, clinically. Another effect, which is a bit less known, is that um, B zero also changes with time. And in fact, uh, Jeff Dunn. Um, talked about that as well as Marta Biancardi. And this is related to the fact that uh, the, the, the lungs, which are filled with oxygen, which is slightly paramagnetic, uh, changes in terms of volume. So it creates a varying uh, susceptibility um, profile. And as we go closer to the lungs, obviously this effect uh, gets even more problematic. So this is an example of a study that we did at 3T. Um, we took um, EPIs. Uh, and we asked the subject to breathe in, uh, held, the, held their, their breath, and then breathe out, held their breath. And um, if we just compare the inspired and the expired state, we see, it seems that the spinal cord is moving, but it's purely artifactual. The spinal cord is not physically moving. It's just related to the fact that the B0 field around that, um, around that region is changing. And if we phase encode in this direction, we have this uh, A2P motion, right? And uh, that's obviously more problematic at higher, uh, at uh, ultra higher field. And this effect, you know, the cord can move by about one centimeter, which is the size of the spinal cord. So it, it really um, destroys every hope for, you know, fine fMRI or DTI studies. And there are also other um, problems that come out, let's, uh, such as ghosting, for example. So we could use navigator for, for that. Uh, when you are to the navigators, which are more precise. The problem is that uh, they don't really tell the, the whole story of the spatial temporal um, variation at, at, at any, any point in space. So with Navigator, we, it's, it might be difficult to, to track down all those uh, variations, which is why we are trying to take an approach um, that is, um, that is uh, tackling that problem at the source. And uh, that was actually an, an idea that originated from a, Chef Dan's group, uh, real-time shimming. And uh, we've implemented that uh, in the spinal cord. So we, we teamed up with um, Resonance Research to build a 24-channel uh, shim-only coil uh, that sits on the patient table. Um, and this uh, shim coil is driven, uh, so each channel, each channel is driven independently from the scanner using a shim amplifier that sits in the uh, equipment room. And we also record the, um, the patient's respiratory trace using a custom bellow that is uh, connected to an absolute um, pressure sensor because we are really interested in the absolute uh, evolution of the, of the chest. That's connected to, um, to a laptop. And so in real time, we can record the, uh, the respiration um, cycle of the, of the person. 
And then uh, via fast connection, we can at the same time record some fast V0 field maps. So field maps acquired at maybe 200 milliseconds so that we can at any point in the respiratory cycle, we can assign a particular a special, um, spe special definition of the visual field. And then once we, once we know uh, the uh, shim coefficients that we want to apply for each of the, uh, of the shim channel, we can then uh, start the experiment, whether it is spectroscopy, EPI, uh, multi echo GRU sequence, and in real time, adjust the um, adjust each of the shim currents uh, during the acquisition. So just to give you an example of how that works, uh, that's, you can see here the, um, the respiratory trace. Oh, obviously this is accelerated. Uh, it's, 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 not a, like it's, it's not a mouse, it's a human being. So um, just accelerated it for the, um, for the purpose of the animation. What you see here is the uh, sagittal view of the spinal cord that apparently moves in the A to C direction. When we switch on the real-time shimming system, uh, we see that the images are actually much more stable. Um, and really to convince you that, that it's not the physical motion of the cord, we've also acquired GRE um, uh, scans, like line, line scans that are less sensitive to uh, variations. And you can see that even if the person is breathing, the spinal cord is, is pretty static. So again, this is really an artifact uh, of the B0 variation. One limitation we, we, we had, however, with, um, with that Shimonli RA coil is that um, the spatial profile is, was very coarse. The elements were far away from the region of interest. And also uh, the, that heavy uh, copper interacted badly with the transmit uh, body coil. So we teamed up with um, Jason Stockman um, and uh, we tried to basically um, implement the ACDC technology for the, for the C-spine. So we transformed the uh, um, receive only RA to um, receive plus transmit some DC current. This is the final product and the, the neck sits here. And we're able to, um, to then combine our real-time shimming uh, framework and pipeline with this ACDC technology in order to um, really show some improvements in terms of uh, static B0, uh, like better homogeneity in terms of static B0 that uh, reduces the signal dropout, as well as uh, reduction in the dynamic B0 variation where we, we would see less ghosting in the images. Um, that's 3T and it's, uh, today is a 7T a symposium. So obviously, um, we wanted. We are extremely excited to implement that technology on our new Terra system uh, in Montreal. So, my lab built this um, beautiful 15-channel uh, receive array coil uh, that will uh, soon be upgraded into a, an ACDC coil after we do some some testing uh, on the on the Terra system. And for the transmit, um, Kyle Gilbert from, uh, from the Robarts build a three-channel dipole that we also hope to use with a parallel transmit system. So we are very much looking forward to, to see those, uh, those results, um, hopefully at the next ISMR, so stay tuned. Um, so to conclude, uh, I would say, uh, actually the, my take-home message has four words. Uh, we want better shimming. Um, and I'm pretty convinced that uh, it's, it's a low hanging fruit uh, in, in terms of uh, um, the kind of technology that is already available. Uh, we should really account for the dynamic variation in the, in the B0 field uh, and not only the, the static one. So hopefully one day uh, spinal cord at 70 could go from, from there to there. Um, and with that, I would like to thank uh, people in my lab. Uh, that's the uh, the tower of the University of Montreal that we see from the, from the plane. Um, and I would also like to warmly thank all the people who, uh, who basically worked with me, uh, former colleagues, uh, and who continue uh, to, to work with me uh, now and in the future, and uh, funding sources, and thank you very much for your attention.